Standing by the Terry and Ted podcast is sponsored by the UPS Store Canada. It's another episode of the Standing By podcast. Hi, I'm Terry DeMonte, and that there is uh, Ted Bird. Hello, Ted Bird. How are you, sir? I'm uh, fine and dandy, as I always am when you and I get together to do one of these things. And the Standing By podcast is proudly sponsored by the folks at the UPS Store Canada. And we're thrilled to have them as our title sponsor for this season of the podcast. If you don't know what the UPS Store is all about, uh, I want to tell you that it's not just for business owners. I'm always going on about the fact that the UPS stores are for business people. However, uh, if you find yourself in a bit of a predicament like we did when we were moving out to British Columbia over a year ago, and uh, we stumbled on stuff that the truck missed, and we stared at this uh, stack of stuff and thought, what are we going to do with this? How are we going to get this across the country now that the truck is gone? What I did was I put the stuff in the car and drove it to the UPS store on Sources Road, and uh, they helped me right away. They made sure I had the right size box. They made sure it was safely packed. They got all kinds of packing materials. They uh, they they just got it all boxed up for me and put a label on it and shipped it. And uh, not too long after we arrived, it arrived. Those are the kinds of problems they can solve for you, whether you're uh, trying to do something for a business that you run out of your home or you need to get cookies from grandma to the other side of the country. The folks at the UPS Stores Canada, and there are over 360 locations all around the country, uh, they can help solve your problems. Go to the upsstore.ca with a big thank you to our friend uh, David Drucker and all the people at the UPS stores across the country. Uh, Ted, are you ready for our guest? I'm very excited, as a matter of fact. I feel like I should have gone out and eaten at a fine restaurant before this episode, <laughs> but I had crackers, cheese, and grapes. <laughs> All right. Well, that's uh, that's very elegant, Mr. Bird. Nicely done. Well, they were, I must say they were, uh, they were garlic, what do you call them? Garlic pita snaps. Oh, wow. So that was garlic. a little highbrow, I thought. And the cheese was, I had two different kinds of cheese. I had an Oka and I had a Jarlsberg. Oh, good. Yeah. Wow, aren't you fancy pants? <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, my guest today, our guess today is a, um, I'm going to call her a friend. She's a good friend. We had a lot of fun on the radio over the years. And um, inside her brand new book, um, she said, the last thing the world needs is another recipe for carbonara. And <laughs> the editor said, maybe not. But I think they might like your recipe for carbonara in this beautiful, beautiful new book called Make Every Dish Delicious, Modern Classics and Essential Tips for Total Kitchen Confidence. Um, Leslie Chesterman is our guest. Hello, Leslie Chesterman. Look what I have. I love that you have that. And hello, Ted. And hello, Terry. And it's nice to see you, even though I know you're very far away. But yeah. I feel like you're just like whenever we spoke, I feel like you're just around the corner. So that's yeah. great. Yeah. Every uh, when I was hosting the morning show at the uh, the old radio station every Wednesday, uh, one of our most popular features during the week uh, when they actually put content on the radio uh, Leslie and I would have a conversation about restaurants and food and sometimes politics. And um, it was kind of like what a dinner table is at uh, Leslie's house. If yeah. you're lucky enough to get a dinner invitation, um, those are the kinds of chats we had. And you you told me a really nice story the other day that I want you to tell. You yeah. had a book launch and, and people talked about it. Yeah. So I was at my book launch and um, uh, a couple of people came up to me and said, Est-ce que Terry Demonte vient ici ce soir? <laughs> they, everybody was so excited to meet Terry. And I said, no, no, no. Uh, malheureusement, Terry a déménagé, mais uh, on espère un jour il va revenir pour mon prochain livre. But I was, and they looked so disappointed. There were oh. so many people who were, you know, really interested in meeting you or seeing oh, you crazy. or whatever. And not only that, but there are a lot of people who contact me on social media or meet me wherever I am. And they're like, I really miss your talks with Terry on Shom. And it's funny because... They're people my age and a little bit younger, but I always think of Shom as, you know, kind of 15 to 18 year olds because, <laughs> but, but the thing is that 15 to 18 year olds who are listening to Shom are still listening to Shom, you know, yeah. today, yeah. our age. And, you know, they're people my age. And I'm like, wow, you still listen to, 
You know, I, I always thought it was intriguing in the morning. I can't handle Led Zeppelin and Van Halen <laughs> in the morning, but a lot of people can, you know, so... Um, yeah. Well, a lot, a lot of people tuned in for the, these particular conversations, Leslie, because, you know, we, we, it was, it was always based around food, but we had these wonderful, and and for, um, for a rock station for a morning show, they were considered to be long chats, but people tuned in for them, and it was a great source of pride to me that a uh, that an equal amount of francophones enjoyed them just as much as anglophones. Yeah, absolutely, and a lot of people actually told me they were driving their kids to school listening to us so and they'd say the kids were listening to us too because one thing that's universal is food you know yeah. we all even if you're talking about restaurants or you're talking about you know what's in a, a mcnugget or anything is that it's it's it there's no age for that kind of talk which has always been i think a reason that that i still have work <laughs> you know because <laughs> if you talk about wine you know there are a lot of people who don't drink there are a lot of people yeah. you know it's not like the kids in the car are going to say mommy do you drink sauvignon blanc or chardonnay you know <laughs> so um it's we all love food we you started it's just such an interesting journey you've been on because you started as a pastry chef and then you were a restaurant critic and then the next thing you know you're you're talking to the folks at uh, radio canada and then you're on the radio with me and then the next thing you know, you've got a cookbook out in French, which, by the way, is the Bible in the kitchen for my wife, Jess. I told you the other day I got yelled at because I cut the strawberries before. How yeah. is it? What did I do Jess, wrong? I cut the right. strawberries. You you cut the stra You took the tops off the strawberries before you washed them. Yes, and I I I got I got shit from Jess, and and I said, what difference does it make? And she said, Leslie says that the water gets in them. She's absolutely right. <laughs> She's absolutely right. I love Jess. She's very smart. So, so, so it's 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 become a Bible in the kitchen, and that's why this book is the English version is now in the house uh, because uh, she ran it and got it right away. Now I I, I want to can you start with the story of your involvement with food? Did it go right. from high school to pastry chef? Right. Well, the first thing is that my relationship with food, I'm convinced, would not be what it was if I didn't grow up in the city that I grew up in, Montreal, because um, Montreal is a very food food. Uh, driven city, food loving, joie de vivre. A lot of the reasons why we love this city are because of this so-called joie de vivre. I don't see it all the time, but <laughs> you know. <laughs> and um, I think the French and the English here really makes for a fantastic food scene. And especially when I was young, you know, in the 70s, which is when I was really young, 80s, the food scene in the rest of Canada was really not there. You know, Vancouver and eventually Toronto absolutely caught up. But we really are a food city here in Montreal. And I always said for years that if I hadn't been for the restaurant scene, I probably would have moved, you know, because it's the thing that keeps me here in so many ways and makes me love it. And um, so having been, uh, you know, a young kid here uh, going to French and English school, I then went to cooking school in French um, and then I worked in French. And then it's it's funny because. I went back and forth working in France and uh, I never worked anywhere where I spoke English. But the really interesting thing happened is that when I ended up at Radio Canada, the reason I ended up starting doing radio at Radio Canada was the day after the Pauline Marois election, when there was the shooting, right, uh, by Mr. Bain at Metropolis, <clears throat> they called in a few Anglophones to come and talk about being an Anglophone and the Anglophone reaction that day after that election, and um, you know, there I was, and you know, I told this quite an interesting story about what happened that night. But the, after the show, they said, "Wait a minute, do you write about food?" And they they said, "We heard you write about food," and I'm like, "Yes, I've been writing about food for over a decade at the Montreal Gazette, which I guess you don't read because <laughs> there's such two solitudes, you know." And um, uh, and so I started doing food. Uh, things there, the bits, whatever you want to call it, for over 10 years now. And recently, when I had my book launch, you know, Aaron Rand was at my book launch, and a woman called Catherine Perrin was at my book launch. And these are two big stars on either side of the radio fold. You know, Aaron and Catherine is huge at Radio Canada. They'd never met or heard of each other. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Talk yeah. about two, I mean, it's just two solitudes all the way. Yeah. And I, I don't think that's ever going to change. Uh, you know, it's it's interesting to me that it, politics even washes over into the food and the restaurant scene. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, 
You know, the, it's funny because that whole thing came up about Pauline Marois saying uh, years ago, she said, I can't get served in French in a Montreal restaurant. And I thought, <laughs> OK, I thought I have been a restaurant critic for 20 years. Only once at Lucille's in NDG did I run into a waitress who did not speak a word of French. But otherwise, I always go out with French people. And it, I mean, you can have English people who have an accent when they speak French, but really no French once. She's saying this happens to her every time she goes out. But I would run into her in restaurants like Alexandre and L'Express. I never saw her go to a restaurant that wasn't French, you know? So I'm like, what's this all about? Yeah, yeah. I don't believe that line at all. I know that there are a lot of English-speaking spe people downtown, but I think there are a lot of bilingual people downtown. It has to happen at the grassroots level. I had an experience last night. I did a, a set at a stand-up comedy club called Le Bordel in, in, on Ontario Street East. It's usually a French club. But on Tuesday nights, they have English stand-up. And the point of the exercise was to get English people out there, uh, out to Ontario Street East, and get them into the club and get them into that French stand-up comedy milieu, which is very vibrant. Um, yeah. But the, the audience was overwhelmingly bilingual francophones. The English people didn't show up. It has to happen at the grassroots level, and it just doesn't seem to for whatever reason. Yeah, I went to a great uh, play that was done at the Centaur and the Théâtre du Nouveau Monde, where they did half of it at the Centaur and half of it at the Théâtre du Nouveau Monde, and you take a bus in between the two. And what they want to do was get people who had only been to the Centaur into a French theater and vice versa. And uh -huh. I met a lot of people. It was fascinating. They're like, I didn't even know this place existed. <laughs> it's like, that's, you know, that's the reality. So you you start we we all have a passion for eating and for food and for restaurants because of where we were born and raised and that's what steered you into uh, um, learning about food and 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 doing the patisserie thing yeah. and then how did you dovetail from that into becoming the restaurant critic because I want to talk a little bit about that because I can't imagine a job that was more fun and also a bigger pain in the ass at the same time. Absolutely. Thank you for pointing that out, Terry. Um, one thing that was interesting about that job is that before, a couple of people before me was Helen Rochester, who was in that job forever. And not only that, but Helen Rochester was the first restaurant critic in Canada and one of the first in North America at the Montreal Star. So these are jobs that when people get into them, they don't leave real fast, you know? <laughs> So I was a cooking teacher at one point when I stopped being a chef because I just didn't like that life. And um, I approached the Gazette to do some stories. And then I eventually approached them and said, what really interests me is restaurant criticism because I'm so, so critical. And um, and I like that. You know, I always read Helen Rochester. I always read everybody in The New York Times and I want to try it. And they said, oh, you know, no, there was another restaurant critic there at the time. And um, I just thought, oh, well, forget about that, because, you know, it's going to be 20 years before somebody leaves that job. And by coincidence, the restaurant critic at the time left the job. And so there was kind of an opening. So they had a few of us trying out for that job. And eventually I got it. And then I lasted 20 years. And then there was another restaurant critic after I left until the pandemic. And now there's nobody. So it's kind of gone. And in Toronto, there's not one restaurant critic. Uh -huh. And in Montreal, on the French side, there are some restaurant critics, but it's not what it used to be. That's outrageous in this city. Yeah, it is, absolutely. It is. And in Chicago, you know, it's funny because it's not only restaurant criticism, but a lot of jobs in newspapers have just completely disappeared. You know, the first to go was the movie critic because they realized that everybody's seeing the same movie, so you just need one, one critic for the whole chain of papers. Um, and then gradually, but I just always thought that a restaurant critic wasn't just about the restaurant, it was about the city itself. And I always wrote a little bit about the history of what I knew. It had to be fun and a little bit educational without being pedantic. And um, it had to be funny and entertaining. The, the most important thing is that a restaurant uh, criticism, the newspaper article is entertaining so that on Saturday morning, when people would get their paper with their coffee, um, it wasn't just like, oh, I loved the, you know, oysters and I hated the roast beef. It was a lot of laughs in between. 
And when when you went into a restaurant, Leslie, did it get to the point where everybody's butt got clenched and everybody went, oh, shit, Leslie Chesterman is here? There was absolutely a lot of butt clenching going on. <laughs> there was a lot of shaking going on. The When the waiters would shake, I knew they recognized me, and I hated that. And that sounds really obnoxious, but honestly, the waiters went from being totally normal to, like, shaking. And so I, um, I, I, I didn't like that. I didn't like other things about the job. And when they start to recognize you, it kind of takes away from the whole experience because they start giving you free dishes. You can sense that it's it's not really an honest situation because if you're representing the customer, you should be anonymous, right? Right. And then that whole thing went out the window because restaurant critics kind of turned into stars in places like England and New York. Although the New York restaurant critic, the New York Times restaurant critic is anonymous. But it's, you know, it, you kind of, once you blow your cover, and there was a very funny thing that somebody posted somewhere that they destroyed some restaurant kitchen. And while they were destroying it, they found my picture in the dining room. <laughs> it's right in the kitchen, in the kitchen, it said Leslie Chesterman. And I think there are other critics there too. It's like the whole place was ripped apart, but our pictures were still there. Like, look out for this one. <laughs> <laughs> Leslie, I want to pick up on something you said about restaurant reviews and how they should be funny and entertaining. Are you familiar with Jay Rayner from The Guardian? Yeah. yeah. Are you, Rayner, yes. are you familiar with his review of Le Sank at the George V uh, Hotel? Absolutely. <laughs> no, absolutely. And I, I, I'm, you know, that's a hard situation because if you're, if anybody's reading that review, they're like, yes, yes, yes. Because we hate the idea of paying way too much, like, extreme, crazy Russian oligarch prices yeah. for menu items. You know, like, Nothing, no like canapé should be $80 or no salad should be $125. So we love reading that, you know, but, and he really went down hard in that restaurant in a very um, smart. And it was brilliant. It was brilliant. Just for, for Tara, I don't know if you've ever seen it, Tara. Let me read a couple of quick segments. He yeah, says. I, I, I have, but for, uh, for people who are watching or listening. The dining room deep in the hotel is a broad space of high ceilings and coving with thick carpets to muffle the screams. <laughs> it, it is decorated in various shades of taupe, biscuit, and fuck you. <laughs> yeah. And that's in the Guardian yeah. newspaper. <laughs> yeah. Are all of his reviews like that, Leslie? A lot of them are. I like also when he likes something because as much as he can go you know, uh, almost overboard. I mean, I could never write fuck you in the Montreal Gazette, no. but um, but he also, when he likes something, he really likes something. So I like, if somebody's going to go that far one way, that they're not always in the bad mood or always hating everything, but as long as they can balance it out and find things they love as well. But, you know, the thing is about super expensive restaurants that I've grown to understand, not appreciate, understand, is that there are a lot of people out there who are super rich in cities like Paris, London, New York, Tokyo, and they want somewhere to drop a ton of money. You know, they want to go somewhere where it's expensive because they have a lot of money and it makes them feel even more rich if they can. You know, a lot of very wealthy people are quite cheap, I've noticed, by the way, but they're not all like that. But some people, when they have gobs of money, want to spend gobs of money, you know. And I learned this by a very rich man who once told me he was looking to buy a big house. And I said, who needs a big house? Get a small, nice house, he says. Leslie, I'm rich. I want a big house. You know, <laughs> so, some people want to drop a thousand dollars plus 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 on dinner, and you can in places like this. You know, so it's to be seen and to be seen, and it means you made it, right? So, God bless them. Yeah, you also you also get what you pay for sometimes. Though I specifically remember being with Terry at uh, Morton Steakhouse in Chicago. And Terry ordered a $300 bottle of wine. And I said, you're out of your mind. What are you paying $300 on a bottle of wine? We can get a nice bottle of wine for a quarter of that price. And he said, just be quiet. <laughs> and the wine came, and it was the best wine I've ever had in my life. And when we left the table, when dinner was over and we left the table, the business associate we were with left half a glass of wine. And and as we were walking away, I was looking back at it like, no, <laughs> what a waste. But it was, it. I mean, $300, who decides if wine is worth that? But, but at the end of the night, I said, that was a good call on Terry's part. That was $300 well spent because we could afford it at the time, and it was really good wine. It was an experience. And by the way, how much are concert tickets these days? Yeah, exactly. $300 is nothing. Not only 
only men, uh, not only women, how much are men paying for shoes? How much is a man's suit? I mean, I know a great suit can last you a long time. But I mean, if you want something better than just regular wine or regular dinner, that's why you go out. I always say to people, don't go out to eat to eat something you can eat at home. Go out to eat to have something a little fancier, you know, because otherwise that is a bit of a waste of money. I mean, I'll go out and eat ro uh, and eat roast chicken, but really you can do that at home. <laughs> right. Go out to have something a little bit, the wine you can't have at home, you know, things like do that. An occasion, to celebrate an occasion. Do you do you have a memorable story about a, a, a restaurant owner who perhaps did not agree with the review that appeared on Saturday? I have several, Terry. <laughs> <laughs> but my favorite was what? the death. My the death threat remains my favorite. Oh, the death threat. The death threat. The, I got it was just a little bit more. I je ne sais quoi when you add a death threat. <laughs> but um, there was one man who said to me, um, it was really a bad restaurant. Okay, like it was on Saint Catherine Street. I don't remember the name because it's long gone. And it was like it was comical because um, our waiter everything said like homemade sorbets, and then we'd say, oh. Really, they're made in house, and the guy would be like, "No, we buy them." You know, like it was like everything was just a disaster. And I wrote the review. I think they got one star. And then one night, I get a phone call at home. Okay, I don't know how I got my number or what. And the chef says to me in French, he says, "I got. I want to get this right." He said, "I'm going to burn down your house. I'm going to blow up your car, and I'm going to murder your dog." Jesus. Okay. And I'm like, how does he know I have a dog? You know, like like. But and, and and he was obviously drunk and it was and somebody said to me years later, they said, did you call the cops? And I said, you know, no, I, I just I just thought, well, somebody didn't like his review. You know, I didn't think he'd really come and murder my dog or blow up my house or whatever. But it was pretty heavy. It was pretty heavy. And there are other I like my favorite one. There was somebody this the man, Alain Creton, who owns Alexandre. I wrote a one star review and that restaurant, which I think is going under. That restaurant was very up and down over the years. And I went and had really not a good meal. And I gave him one star and he sent me flowers. Okay. And he sent me flowers with this note that said, you know, thanks for the review. Blah, ha, ha, ha. And I, it was like a funeral arrangement. Yeah. Right. And so it was like a lot of flowers. And then I wrote about it again, like four years later, and it was very good. And so I started off the review by saying the last time I gave him a bad review and he sent me flowers. And at the end I said, you know, at the bottom, I said, don't worry, Mr. Croton, you don't have to send me flowers. And the next day he sent me chocolates and he said, <laughs> he said, at least they're not flowers. Right. So I like people with a sense of humor. I mean, yeah. it's yeah. I'm not there to, to to ruin anybody's business. I was always there to tell it like it is. Right. And and, and of all the restaurants, I mean, Shea Alexandre in uh, in is a restaurant of Montreal. That's a, uh, I mean, people like to be seen there during the F1 race and stuff. But uh, I can't think of a more overrated and more overpriced place in downtown Montreal. That's just my opinion. Also, yeah, well, I think, also, I think closing, yeah. he also sends all the girls flowers and chocolates, oh, Leslie. Not, not, not to burst <laughs> your bubble. <laughs> <laughs> so one of the things you and I have talked about, my wife and I talk about this all the time, so do my friends, especially now that I don't live in the city anymore. And um, by the way, Vancouver has not caught up. It's just, oh, right. it's just a sea of chains and shit. We're <laughs> staying with them. Yeah, Vancouver comes and goes as a great Ugh. food city. And you know, it's not cheap. Ugh. I like Bo Bai, but there's a lot of Asian food too. Yeah. But uh, yeah, I know. Yeah. So uh, we were talking about the, the thing about Quebec and, and you correct me if I'm wrong. If you go, whether you go for, like if you go to a cascroute for a hot dog, the people making that hot dog wants you to want you to have the best hot dog they could possibly put together, and they're proud of the hot dog they put on your plate. Same with their poutine or their hamburger, all the way up to L'Express. And everybody has this pride, and at least the ones that last, because if you don't have that, you don't last in Quebec. Quebecers will not eat crap food, and they will not go to a shit restaurant. And it's built into the culture. Don't you agree, Leslie? Yeah, I agree. I mean, I've had some people who, you know, maybe not a hot dog, but who gave me some other things that weren't up to par. But I just think that the level of cooking here is very high. So I find that when you go to other parts of, especially Canada, but it's the United States too, or England too, is that you'll run into a lot of places where people just don't know how to cook, you know? So it's hard to, to kind of get mad at them. But then you're like, if you can't cook, don't open a restaurant, you know? So, I mean, it seems obvious to me, but 
Um, so there really is a line drawn between people who can cook and people who can't cook. And I even think to to make a hot dog, you have to know how to cook. Seriously, yes. like just to get some basic things right, like don't put, you know, you don't want a soggy hot dog if it's steamed. It's got to be just right. So I think there is a lot of pride in your work when you know what you're doing. It's when people are oblivious to what they're doing that they don't care, you know. So but and and one thing that I you mentioned chain restaurants and there are a lot of them out west. In fact, the last time I was in Tofino, I ran into all these chain restaurants I'd never heard of because they're not here. Right. And um, I'm like, wow, you know, don't forget chain restaurants. Everything just comes and is heated up. So there's no cooking needed. So nobody they're just putting things on a plate according to a picture. There's no they're not implicated in the action of cooking at all in those chain restaurants. You know, like, I, yeah, I also, I, also, I also find it's a it's a, an exposure thing and a taste thing. Like I find, you know, people here have said to us, oh, you got to try this place. And we go and we think, oh, my God, why did they think this was good? <laughs> and I think when you're not exposed to really great food and you're not adventurous about eating food, what you think is fantastic ain't necessarily so. Like it's it's in the taste buds out here. I think what you know what people what what passes for amazing stuff is because you're not used to anything else. You know well, what I mean? That, yeah. Well, I really know what you mean because as a restaurant critic, a lot of people would say to me, "Go to this place; it's great." And I would go, and it wouldn't be so great. And then I'd write a review, and then they'd write me back saying. You know, I can't believe you didn't like my favorite restaurant. You're like, well, maybe my I eat out all the time. So what my experience is, is an equivalent. So I always say to people, be careful if you're recommending your favorite restaurant, because maybe that's your favorite restaurant because they treat you really well. Or maybe you've been eating the same dish for, you know, 10 years and you only like that dish. Have you eaten things? Have you eaten everything on the menu? Uh, have you gone to the bathroom? I mean, I, I don't want to say the bathrooms, you know, Anthony Bourdain, I think, always said if the bathroom's dirty, who cares about the restaurant? But the restaurant can't be clean or the kitchen can't be clean. But um, it, it's about so much more than just something being your favorite restaurant. It's about the whole establishment working well as a restaurant. But you're absolutely right. If people aren't exposed to a lot of things, they're, 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 even when I was younger, a lot of restaurants I really loved, I like less when I start to eat out a lot more. Why? Because I was exposed to a lot more food. You know, it's like, you know, when you think about it, Terry and Ted, like when I was young, for us going to a great movie was going to see a Jodie Foster movie at the Van Horn Theater. OK, we're like, wow, you know, mm -hmm. and then as you get older, you're yeah. going through everything on Netflix going, no, 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 no. You know, as you get older, you just you've already been through so much. You've seen so many movies that you almost don't want to see anything anymore. I think ultimately after eating all this food, I, nothing will <laughs> interest me. You know, I'll be like, I just want the perfect apple because you know, all this other stuff. I, I look at food that was really popular in the 90s and I'm like, it looks so dated today. And, you know, I hate to say it, but the 90s weren't that long ago, you know. So we do. We just we have so much experience, I'm sure, even with our work. You know, after a while at the radio, you were probably less enthusiastic about it than you were on day one. Right. Yeah, you're probably right. Although, I mean, you you know, I, I, I still to this day, I miss the microphone and I, I loved what I did so much. Uh, much like you, I mean, you know, yeah. in your books, uh, both the French and English books, you can see the joy that you derive from right uh, the the yeah. whole the whole food, not just cooking, but the whole right. food thing. That's the, absolutely, you know, the pic the yeah. pictures, the stories, the book, the both books, the French and English book, are just amazing. Yeah, thank you. I but I agree with you. Even what you're saying about your radio as as a restaurant critic, you know, some nights I would just go out and I'm like. Oh, you know, you don't want to complain about having to go out to eat at a nice restaurant, but you're like, oh, I've got to find parking, I've got to dress up, I've got to, I hope it's good. And then bang, you hit a great restaurant and you love your work all over again. And you write a review that you want to tell people, look, this great restaurant is here, this guy's a great chef, and this woman nobody knows about or whatever. So there are times that it's so fulfilling. It's sometimes the kind of grind, you know, the kind of daily grind of, when you start having to complain about going out to eat, you have a problem, you know. Let me uh, let me complain uh, a little bit and ask you what you think about uh, some of the things that are beginning to get on my nerves about restaurants. Uh, number one is uh, you have the table for ninety minutes. Um, that there's that goddamn thing. And get a load of this. There's a restaurant out here that we're going to as we we record this on a Wednesday morning. 
Uh, we're uh, Jess and I are going to a restaurant on Friday called St. Lawrence Restaurant. Oh, yes. Uh, apparently, yeah, apparently local, you know, or a um, uh, Montreal guy who's bringing Quebec food to blah, blah, blah. And it's hard to get into. And we made a reservation a long time ago. And we're going with two other people. And get a load of this. Up front, $445 up front. Before you get there on Friday, they want $445. For two for or four? four? For four. Okay. For four people. That includes the food. You're prepaying for the food. And you're prepaying for a 20% tip. And I'm a big tipper if the goddamn service is good. But when you're, when like, I we're going Friday night and I'm trying to keep an open mind, but I'm already pissed. Yes. Because that well, is yes. a level of pretension that you better be able to pull off on Friday night. So yeah. there are there are these new things. What do you think of these new, like why are restauranters doing this? Okay, so the first thing, well, let's go with your second point, which is yeah. the paying up front. The paying up front is not the fault of the restaurant. The paying up front is a, all the jerks who don't show up for the reservation. So these are the no-shows that are killing restaurants. So St. Lawrence now even has a Michelin star. And I think on the 100 best list, it came in first last year. This is a great restaurant with very high food costs, which means they're paying a lot for their ingredients and their staff. And their chef. So they want people. So if people are booking a table, they want people to show up for their table. So what are they doing now? They're asking people to put a deposit. And, you know, here in Quebec, I don't know about Vancouver, but that's kind of illegal. You're not allowed to charge for a service not rendered. I don't know if that's the situation over there. But I once got caught in, I was in the Napa Valley and I wanted to go to a three Michelin star restaurant and I was ready to go and everything. They asked me for a $250 US deposit for one person. This was about 10 years ago. Yes. And um, the night I was supposed to eat in the restaurant, there was a massive windstorm, like trees falling, like, you know, the road runner running by. I mean, it was so scary. And I was, I had to drive there and it was a long drive at night on a highway covered in debris, You'd be really bad. And I called them up and I said, I really want to come, but this weather situation is is frightening. And then the girl said, oh, yeah, well, if you don't come, we're charging you. Okay. Yep. And so I got in my car and I went because obviously my life is worth $250, right? Yeah. So I went and, and also you can't drink in Napa if you're driving, which is fine, which is great. But I got there in my bill. I mean, and then I had to drive back. So the thing is that we're now held hostage to that reservation. Like, you better show up or you're losing a lot of money. Oh, yeah, they, they tell That's you. a lot they of do. money that they're asking you. I mean, if it was only $100, maybe I would have done it. But yeah. for you guys, $400. If you don't yeah. show up, it's they want to cover their food cost. They tell you it's it's non-refundable. But the other thing is, you know, you, you know, because you and I went there just as it closed, and I don't know how I didn't cry. Um, I used to go, my Friday nights were at Les Mans des Oliviers, and I would go for 7.30, quarter to 8, and that was the night. I would bring friends there, and that was the night. And we would be at that table with Grand Marniers and coffees at 11.30. Right. And now, if you're having a nice time, people are tapping you on the shoulder and go, piss off, we need the table. Yeah. I, 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 I don't know about that. I recently ate in Paris at a restaurant where it, we paid, I hate saying this because it makes me sound like I'm rich, which is not the, it's, I, I, this is for work, you know, yeah. <laughs> um, where I think dinner cost us close to $800 and we had the table. They told us the table between 6.30 and 8.30 and it was a very tough restaurant to find. So we got a little bit lost. So I think we got there at 6.45 or something. I have never been rushed through a dinner that quickly in my life. I mean, the, you you finish one plate, whoom, the next one would come down, the next one come down. So I think we had an eight-course meal in an hour and a half, and then it was made very obvious to us that it was time to go. So much so that the last dish did not have a wine pairing with it because they wanted to clear the plates. So, I mean, I, I walked out of there mad. I will never yeah. go back. The food yeah. was delicious, but I don't like being for that much money Rushed oh. out of my table. I mean, I understand if you're eating a beauties, you know, yeah, yeah, uh, that I, people at the door are waiting for the table. Yeah, yeah. I even understand L'Express to a certain extent. Yeah. But yeah. that eight hundred dollar dinner that they were like, and yeah. you know what I noticed, Terry? They were super friendly all the way through until we paid the bill. Then it was like, get oh, out. Well, right. Yeah. 
Yeah, it's uh, it's uh, you know it, I used to get pissed off at people that that lingered over their coffee at the counter at Cosmos because Cosmos had eleven stools and there was a lineup out the door. Hey, yeah. you finish your eggs? Fuck off. Yeah, get where about the person with the laptop? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that you part I don't see anybody. Right? Yeah, that that part I understand. I I get that, you know. And Tony was trying to make money, like eat your cheeseburger and and get out. Yeah, yeah. But you know, if you're spending, you know, four or five hundred dollars, you know, it's like now I'm at the age where dinner is the event. If you have people over to the house, yeah. you know, you don't serve them and and then and then say, okay, nine thirty, out you get. <laughs> yeah. As, as your mom says, Terry, here's your hat. What's your hurry? <laughs> <laughs> you come down in your pajamas, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Leslie, yeah. you had mentioned off the top about uh, that you worked in, in France. Yes. So a, a multiple-part question. Where did you work in France? What did you do? And to what extent is the stereotype of a uh, volatile French chef a stereotype, and how much of it is true? Okay, so the first time I went to work in France, I worked in Lyon um, in a beautiful pastry shop. Uh, I was 22 years old, and most of the people I worked with were between the ages of 15 and 18. Um, the chef was probably um, almost 30, and the, these kids were really young, and so they would do a lot of really stupid things because they were between 15 and 18. So it was kind of normal that they got screamed at in a way like uh, when my kids were 15 and 18, I screamed at them a lot too, <laughs> you know, to be honest. But when I worked there the second time, I worked for a famous chef there called Yves Thuriez in the southwest of France, uh, near not too far from Toulouse. And there the kids were older and better, and where it was a kitchen, not a pastry shop. And there I saw real psychological abuse every day. I sexual abuse on my part, wow. but I will say, quite frankly, um, I actually worked with a guy every day who would pull my chef's jacket open, put his face down the front of my shirt, and smell me. Jesus Murphy. Oh, you know, and I just thought, who is this jerk? This oh. jerk, by the way, was my boss. Okay. Wasn't much I could do about that. Um, but I I I found the way that the chef treat the the chef treated some of the people who were there that he just did not like. I saw a, a huge uh bucket of cream poured over the head of a guy. I saw people screaming, I saw uh and terrible screaming. And then sometimes, you know, they'd make up an hour later and the next day everything would be fine. But they were under so much pressure. And the pressure of a service when it's going on is something else. So if somebody like burns the fish or doesn't pay attention, they got it hardcore. I mean, real. I mean, nobody I haven't seen anybody treated that way in the kitchen uh, for years, but as bad as people say. I know from I know from 25 years myself in 12 step recovery that there's a very high percentage of uh, of uh, high end restaurant kitchen workers who end up in Alcoholics Anonymous or Cocaine Anonymous yeah. or wherever. Appar apparently, from I mean, just the, the anecdotal evidence I see and hear is, is that is that substance abuse is quite rampant in the industry in the kitchens. Yeah, absolutely, especially in the 80s and the 90s. Uh, alcohol is very interesting in kitchens because. Uh, I, I worked with people who were obviously drinking all day long. Their coffee cups were full of booze. Um, but I didn't know that until later, to, well, until people told me. I saw chefs who drank. In professional kitchens, you get a kind of a wine that is used just for cooking. So they put salt and pepper in the wine so people don't drink it. They drank it anyway. I saw people drink alcohol that they add a kind of gelatin into it so people don't drink it. They drank it anyway. I saw a lot of young kids under so much tr pressure that they didn't drink while they were working, but they drank till they dropped after the, the night was over, um, extremely stressed out, extremely depressed, turning to alcohol for solace. And another thing that I saw was, um, you know, a lot of people in the restaurant industry rewarding people in the kitchen with beer and booze. So at the end of a shift, uh, beer is on everybody. Uh, here you go. Like, I remember Normala Priest telling me they did a big charity event. And after the event where they raised a lot of money, because chefs are often uh, asked to raise money for foundations, uh, somebody said, come into this hotel room. And, you know, Normal said, uh, we didn't know what we'd get. And he said, there were two cases of Labatt Blue to say thank you to the chefs. So that's another thing, too, is that this way of if the shift went well, let's all get shit faced together. That's fine until everybody's doing it every night for 10 years. Yeah. And that happens a lot, too.
You know what I saw on a menu the other night? It's funny you bring this up, Leslie. At the first time, I said to Jess, look at this. Uh, on the menu at the bottom, it said six pack for the kitchen, 10 bucks. I saw that too recently. Yeah, yeah you can During you can now buy, buy beers for the kitchen. Yeah. I thought that was very weird. Hey, you mentioned yeah. you mentioned Lyon. Um, I've never had, ate better in all my life uh, than I did in Italy. Um, but a, a close tie is Lyon. I've I had some of the the most spectacular meals of my life when I was lucky enough to be in Lyon. And one of the most famous cooks, chefs in the world, Paul Bocuse, was in Lyon. And you have a Paul Bocuse story. Can you tell it? Oh, which one? Well, there you go. You <laughs> decide. Pick one. <laughs> if, if you know anything about chefs and cooking and French cooking, Paul Bocuse is like Rocket Richard. He's like the Jean Beliveau of of cooking, you know? Okay, I think I might. Well, the first chef I ever interviewed was Paul Bocuse. I was, um, when I started the Montreal Gazette, they put out a call for somebody to go interview Paul Bocuse because a lot of the staff at the Gazette couldn't speak a word of French. And um, so, sorry, I hear my cat in the background. Uh, right. Couldn't say, couldn't hear, couldn't say, speak a word of French. Bring her the up. Cat? There she is. <laughs> What's her name? And she's distracting me, Alice. So, um, yeah, so nobody could speak French. So I was sent out to interview Paul Bocuse. I'd never interviewed anybody, but I'd worked in Lyon, so I knew a lot about Paul Bocuse. And, um, yeah, I had a terrible, I had a dinner where I drank too much champagne, so the next day I was, I, I was, let's say, not in great shape to interview Mr. Bocuse, but I had to get there at 9 o'clock in the morning at the Ritz Bar, and I got there, and everybody warned me. They said, he doesn't like women or he likes them too much. Um, he's very difficult. He won't answer your questions. He'll gaslight you the whole time. And just the opposite. He couldn't have been nicer. He couldn't have been more professional. And then I walked from the Ritz to a restaurant called Les Caprices de Nicolas, where we're all having lunch, a journalist's lunch together. And I thought to myself, I'm walking down the street with Paul Bocuse. And people, it was like, I swear, it was like I was with Bono. People were like, you know, on the street in Montreal, recognize Bocuse. And I I've never walked so slowly in my life. Like, <laughs> I want everybody, like, where are all the ex-boyfriends? You know, like, <laughs> I want to see every, all my ex-teachers, all, you know. And we we're walking together, and he was so lovely. And he, you know, it's funny because um, we think that people like this are very pretentious, like French co cooking and French food and everything. You know, when Bocuse's restaurant got its second Michelin star, there was an outhouse in the back to go to the bathroom. It was not the posh, super Buckingham Palace of restaurants that it is today. This is a man of very, very humble origins uh, who had three, two mistresses and a wife. One he had breakfast with, one lunch, one dinner. Um, and, I mean, there is nobody like this man. They called him the Pope of Cooking for a reason, just because he was larger than life, although he was probably shorter than I was. He's probably about 5'7". But the effect of just walking down the street, like four streets with him, I don't know. There must have been at least 20 people who literally fell over saying, oh, my God, it's Paul Bocuse on the street, you know, and I, I don't think today Danielle Boulud would get that reaction or a lot of people would. I mean, you know, probably Kim Kardashian would, sadly, but um, he really was that big of a, an icon to people, even in this city, you know. Did you get to eat his food? I did. Well, I yeah, I, I so I went to eat there twice. I went to eat there when I was 22, when I worked in Lyon. Because when you work in Lyon, especially I was there in 1989, all the kids knew what he had done the night before, where his car had been spotted, if he was at the market that morning. It was it, He was like a cult leader for haute gastronomie. So I, by the time I left there, I thought I'm going to have to go and eat there because I've heard so much about it. And it was one of the best meals of my life. The bill for two was $300. Then I went back exactly 25 years later, right before he died, so he was not in the dining room at that time. And I had lunch, which was then $800. Jeez. And it was one of the dis biggest disappointments of wow. my life. Wow. Because it was, there's not a single woman in the place. It is like the Buckingham Palace of restaurants. Um, but very unfriendly. You know, you had to eat quickly, like Terry was saying. You know, way overpriced, crowded tables, American tourists, uh, just you know, you, you it's hard to relive uh, yeah. luster. I'm sure it's like going to a concert when you were young that was great, and then you go back and they don't sing as well, and yeah. you don't feel like 
being crowded the way you did. So it was a very different experience. I think uh, my, my Jess and I say all the time, the internet has ruined everything. The and internet has ruined true. everything because people talk about it on the internet. You know, it's like trying to get near the Trevi Fountain now. Have you seen, you know, I know this sounds very pretentious. Yeah. I don't mean it to be, but have you seen yeah. a picture of the Trevi Fountain lately? They're going to have to put gates up because everybody yeah. wants an Instagram moment and it's it's overrun yeah. with. Yeah. With, and yeah. The surprise element when you go to a restaurant is gone yeah. because if you yeah. look at their website before, in yeah. fact, some restaurants have a banned uh, people coming in with phones mm -hmm. to to they want people to feel surprised by what they're getting because right. otherwise you're going to say, well, it looked better on the Internet. And I always say to Chess, be careful what you put on your Internet page, because if you're serving the same dish, and it doesn't look as good. Yeah, yeah, yeah no, it sucks. We're going to continue to talk uh, food and we'll talk more about the cookbook with uh, Leslie Chesterman. We just want to take a moment to uh, thank a couple of our supporters of the Standing By of, uh, podcast. And uh, speaking of surprises, we always, I always say this, and uh, Ted and I always laugh about this, that uh, the folks from Voswin uh, approached us and said, you know, we'd like to support the Standing By uh, podcast. And we said, well, who are you guys and what do you do? And they said, well, um, we, uh, we uh, well, I don't know exactly what they do, Ted. Uh, I, I They're like engineers. To say, they're, yeah, an they, they, they're an engineering they, they, consulting firm. Yeah, engineering consulting firm talking to us two knuckleheads. Yeah. As I like to say, they can take an idea from your head and put it in your hands. Sean Smith, the president and founder of Voswin, figures the people who listen to and watch this podcast are uh, people who could use uh, their services. Uh, what they do is if you have an idea or a service or a product that requires an engineering component and you don't know what to do, that's where Voswin comes in. They help you do uh, or fulfill that need. As an example, uh, Sean says, we designed and developed a night vision motion detection system for a customer who had an issue with someone or something coming into the yard and wanted to know what. We did the full design and software, and at the end of the day, they figured out that there was a raccoon who was nesting under the guy's deck. They worked with a plumber who wanted a better way to detect moisture for people's sump pumps. So they listened to the challenges that he had, reviewed what was in the market, and designed a small unit that he was able to install. Once the numbers got high enough, they put him in touch with a manufacturer, and now they produce those for his client. So that's the kind of thing that Voswin can do. You've got an idea and you're not sure you know, how to perfect it or where to take it, uh, that's what they do. If it's an engineering uh, component, that is Voswin's specialty. Stop the spin. Call Voswin. Vision to innovation. Voswin.com. Mechanical and industrial engineer and design. Electrical engineer and design. And software engineer and design. Are you an innovator and and or an inventor? Call Voswin. Voswin.com. And another one of our supporters is the good people at Matt La Bonheur. It's a, another of the uh, family-run businesses that we love to speak on behalf of. Uh, Matt La Bonheur started in a little store that's still there on Guayne Boulevard in Saint Genevieve, just around the corner where for you can get a great hot dog at La Roulette, by the way, but that's another story. Um, the uh, folks at uh, Matt La Bonheur started there years ago, over 25 years ago now, with their very first store and got interested in sleep and sleep technology, not just mattresses, but linens and pillows, but only things that have to do with a good night's sleep you will find in these beautifully uh, designed stores with terrific staff that, has, uh, that have all been trained by the family that runs this family-owned, Quebec-owned uh, business that has uh, been taking care of Montrealers' sleep uh, for, like I said, over 25 years now. So whether you're in the market for a new mattress for the kids, a new mattress for the guest room, or you've been on your mattress for way too long, highly recommend that you drop in and get the shopping experience at Matla Bonheur. And if you go, you can tell them you listen to the podcast, use the uh, promo code TEAR05 or TED04, and they'll give you an extra 5% off your purchase. Start at matlabonheur.ca. Leslie Chesterman is our uh, special guest. You know, I was looking at the book last night, Leslie, Make Every Dish Delicious, which is available now everywhere you go. And I I just wondered, it, this book looks like it took you like 25 years to put together. I mean, just 
Like if you open the, the book just on eggs alone, you know, the classic French omelet. I mean, just the description for that, along with poached eggs, hard boiled eggs, Danielle scrambled eggs, like the, these would have taken, you know, I look at that and I think, well, that would have taken a day by itself. Like where, how long yeah. did this take you to put together? Well, I'd say a lifetime because, um, you know, it's funny that you say that because I, I always look at cookbooks because I did review cookbooks for a long time. And I always thought I was always skeptical a little bit of people who are really young who are putting out a cookbooks because I think it takes a long time to learn to cook. I mean, I'm one of these people who thinks everybody should cook, men, women, doesn't matter, because I think we should have more control over what we put in our mouth instead of you know leaving it up to processed food. It's less expensive. It's it's there are a million reasons why I think we should cook. And I think it's encouraging that if you start to cook a little bit and put a little bit of effort into it, you can get good quite quickly. But to be really quite good or really kind of master it, it takes a lifetime. So when I did this book, I really wanted to do a book that was helpful for people. I don't think everybody needs just a ton of recipes. They can get that all over the Internet. I think you need a lot of handholding and a lot of recommendations and suggestions and I think that takes a long time to figure out, you know, you have to be a certain age before you figure out what people need and what they don't need. And um, I think you need recipes that are reliable and work. And I think you need a lot of handholding. You know, these days there's something when we we're talking about the Internet before. And I think there's something that people want to be told what to do. People are always asking me, where should I go for restaurants? People say, do you have a recipe for chocolate cake? I don't know if it's that people don't have time anymore or they want to find somebody that they trust to get information instead of wasting. You know, let, let's say you want to go somewhere on vacation and you want to eat out in a restaurant. You know, we all go to like TripAdvisor or Yelp or whatever, but because you, you don't want to go to the wrong place, right? You want to go to the right. You have two days wherever you're going and you want to go to a good place for dinner. You don't want to go to the place across the street that's not good, right? So they're always reaching out for advice. And I think people need hand-holding and advice more than yeah. ever. So that's what that book is all about. Yeah, simple things like, you know, I noticed when I was looking at it this morning, you know, you small tip that I, you know, I don't know, cause I, you know, J Jess is getting really good in the kitchen. So I back away. Um, uh, when you're baking, buy large eggs. This is something yeah. I wouldn't have thought of. Yeah, when you're sauteing onions, add a bit of salt so they don't burn too quickly. There, you know? Yeah, these these kinds of things. Yeah. And the, the other thing I love, the, the books are just beautiful. You must be so proud of them, Leslie. Well, I'm proud of them because, you know, it's funny, years ago, if you if you wrote a cookbook or published a cookbook in Quebec, the quality of the book wasn't great. You know, in yeah. Canada, it wasn't great. The really beautiful cookbooks were coming out of places like New York and London, okay? France, they barely had any cookbooks. And, you know, I'd see cookbooks that came out of here and I thought they were a lot of them weren't great, you know. And so I, when I decided that I want to do a cookbook here, I was a little bit worried. But the thing is that there is a lot of talent in Quebec when it comes to everything artistic. There's a lot of talent in Quebec in all yeah. and a lot of untapped talent in Quebec. And I really have a fantastic team that worked on this publisher, photographer. And I don't think we would have had the same result 10 years ago. I think it's kind of things are changing very quickly here when it comes to production of books. And there are a lot of great writers, there are a lot of great people, but now things are getting a little bit more world-class when it comes to doing things like this. So you don't have, I mean, for Quebecers, they'd go to Toronto or they'd go elsewhere, but you know, there's really good people here. You started with a French book and, and then went to the English book. Why, why did you start in French and did the success of the French book lead to the English book? Well, Yes, more or less, because I had as big an audience here in French and English. Yeah, I liked the publisher, the French publisher. And I figured that if I was from Quebec and I was working in French and English, if I didn't go to the French audience first, I would be neglecting an audience that's very important and ultimately bigger here. And I really think more faithful than if you have a big audience across Canada uh, here, they feel closer to you. So I went to a French publisher and then I thought it would be very easy to get it translated into English, but that's not true. But I knew that people who'd written English books and they told me it was close to impossible to get it published in French. Mm. So I, it was kind of a gamble and I thought it would be much easier, but eventually we had the great publisher, Simon and Schuster came on to do the, the English book, but that was not easy, you know, because if let's say there was a publisher in, um, 
Nova Scotia and they're like, could you put the time that these take and maybe if they're gluten friendly, like they wanted all this stuff. And I'm like, that's not what this book is about. But so it's it's really hard to work in both languages because the publishers aren't really open to necessarily translating for anybody. Could you uh, uh, tell me about the photographer? Because I'm looking at the picture of rigatoni with rapini and sausage, yeah. and I want to eat the page. I know. Well, I actually have. <laughs> I, have I also have a new French book, and she. Oh. Uh, this is called Un Weekend Chez Leslie, and I, I hope we can get it translated into English. But um, the we the pictures. The first book was so um, successful that we did. The second book, but the only complaint I heard about the first book was people saying there aren't enough pictures. But I mean, the second book, I mean, look at this. I mean, oh, I mean, that is just like that's a chicken dish and a beef dish. And and, you know, it's the photographer's name is Maud Chauvin, Maud Chauvin. And she really is. She does a lot of pictures for a lot of people in Quebec. But uh, we have a very special relationship and there is just absolutely beautiful. I mean, yeah, is it just ever? gorgeous, like, you know. Uh, yeah, so I think a photographer makes a difference. And I see a lot of nice books that don't have nice pictures or nice pictures in a bad book. So you have to have both. People yeah. like to take pictures of their food and uh, post it on social media. And I know that because I do it myself all the time. Like something I'll make at home for me. Here's my potatoes and chicken. <laughs> no, I don't know why I do that, but I do. Somebody said to me, um, they said, um, they said, I noticed that there are a lot more pictures of your dinner on Instagram than there are of your kids. They said, I think that's a bit sad. So then I said, oh, you're absolutely right. So now I ask my kids to hold my dinner. Uh, so we get my dinner, but they're in the picture too. You know, it's like, and I'm like, move your face. It's in the way. I can't see the chicken, you know? So, uh, no, no, no. I, I mean, it's, you know, it's a fun thing that we all share that because, yeah. especially if you make it yourself, because even if it's not great, you made it and you're proud of it, you know? Yeah. So, uh no, I, I do that all the time. And my sister always like has her hand in there just to bug me. <laughs> I, I have to say some people post stuff, you know, you see it on, on Facebook or Instagram and they, you know, they post stuff that they made. And, and you know, often my reaction is, oh, why would you post that picture? That Can, looks Harry, imagine what I'm thinking. Just imagine yeah. what I'm thinking. <laughs> I want to move back to restaurants, Leslie. I, I've, we've, we've, I've done this to you before. Um, and, uh, you know, because our, our audience for the podcast is by and large a Quebec audience from Montreal. And and also when we break down, you know, Ted and I have looked at, at the statistics of the podcast. There are ex-Montrealers everywhere <laughs> that listen absolutely, yeah. and, and check it out. But I, I, I want to put you on the spot because I, 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 I know – um, you've got some favorite spots. Uh, talk about some of them. Uh, start with L'Express if you want, because uh, boy, oh boy, do I miss that restaurant. Um, what What is it about, you know, mention some of the restaurants and, and, and tell us what it is you're looking for when you go to a, a good restaurant. Well, I like L'Express because I have a lot of history there. I used to live on Berry Street when I was at cooking school, and I went to L'Express, I think, the first time when I was 17 years old, although it opened in 1983, but I didn't go earlier because I was not, you know, I was not going on the other side of St. Lawrence, right? <laughs> because I'm English, right? I never went to the other side. Yeah. And eventually I got there, and I haven't looked back. But um, L'Express is a restaurant that makes me think I'm not in Montreal, which is a strange thing to say about my favorite Montreal restaurant. But I just, I, I look around, and when I'm in L'Express, and I think... I'm in France, and there's something very soothing about that. And um, and I love the setup of the room. I love the menu. I love the fact that the people who own the restaurants actually came from a theater background, so they made it very theatrical. And if you know that when you're in the restaurant, you'll see it differently because it's a little bit like a stage set. It's not just a restaurant. You They wanted you to be walking into a French movie, you know? And... Um, and I love the waiters. I love the seriousness. You know, no no chef has ever threatened to kill me who works there. Um, that's all I look for in a restaurant, Terry. And um, but um, I love the French fries. I love when the you know during the pandemic there were no pickles. I hear the pickles are back. Um, I, and I I hate to admit it, but I especially love the amazing wine list. And um, and I love where it is on Saint Denis Street, which has gone through so many ups and downs. Not as much as Saint Lawrence Street, but Saint Denis Street really has seen its glory days and less glory days. There, and you know, I really love it. I really love Le Mayac. I think Le Mayac is a great restaurant. It's uh, for its same designer as L'Express, uh, Luc Laporte, who's passed away unfortunately. Uh, 
again, this beautiful room with a real atmosphere. And I, I, you know, I'd love to see a waiter in this kind of tuxedo and, you know, the, the, the black and white. And again, very good food. Um, I can eat the same thing every time I go there. Great French fries. I mean, this, there's a little bit of a theme going on here. Um, but, um, you know, I also love places like um, there's a new restaurant on Van Horn called Provisions. And Provisions is a butcher shop. And next to the butcher shop is they put some tables. So you really get beautiful food. The guys are so laid back and nice. And I went in there a lot during the pandemic to buy stuff. And uh, they have a little terrace on the side and not too far from my house. I love places like, you know, Tavern on the Square, a great restaurant. I haven't been for a long time because it's a little bit far from where I live, but very friendly restaurant. I love the the people there. It's just a cool restaurant full of, it's kind of an Anglo restaurant, but it's, I like, that's another reason I like Tuck Shop. Yep. Um, another restaurant I love is one called Foxy run by Diane Solomon, which is a beautiful restaurant with gorgeous food. She also owns a Leaving Gourmando. Um, the Great Bakery Cafe down in Old Montreal. Um, you know, there are a lot of there are places I love. Like, um, if I'm eating something Italian, I love Impasto. Uh, I actually ate there with Terry when I reviewed it years ago. And across the street, they have a pizzeria called Gemma. I love those guys. They also own Chez Toussignon, um, Stefano Faita, and Mark, Mike Forgione, two great chefs yeah, who great I knew ones. when they were babies. You know, babies. <laughs> Um, and so there's something about, you know, I recently went to a great restaurant in the Laurentians called La Belle Histoire. And there there is a couple there that run that restaurant. It's not cheap, but boy, what a night. I mean, the most dedicated restaurant people ever. And they started during the pandemic and they've had a really hard time because they started with nothing. And now they're they're getting rave reviews that now that they're up to speed after what they went through. Um, there's an amazing bakery in the Laurentians called uh, Boulangerie Merci La Vie. Uh, run by, you know, <laughs> people who were not doing this for a living 20 years ago, who now make the best bread anywhere that you can find. And um, I like finding, you know, these kind of places that that are classics like L'Express, you know, yep. and yet also the places that I've seen grow and turn into something over the years. You know, it's funny, there's a restaurant, if I look at a restaurant like Joe Beef that's gone through so many changes lately, you know, I remember when Joe Beef wasn't was just starting, you know, and they had like all those tables in that small place. And th there was like a little cheese table by the door that once somebody opened the door and they hit a cheese and it went flying onto the floor. <laughs> hilarious because I saw them put the cheese right back where it was. And, you know, that was such a different atmosphere. And then as it gets very famous and everything, I'm a little less interested because I remember the days when a lot of these restaurants were just starting. And I'm happy with all restaurants that have success. But I was always happy to go to those restaurants before they got super famous or big. Or You know, my favorite of Toke was not in their their place now. Yeah. My favorite Toke was in 1993 when they opened up and Normal Laprise was cooking in the front window. You know, so it's, it's a little bit hard when you have these nostalgic um, feelings towards restaurants that when you go into them today, you remember the great days of Grace, you know, so, so that's why I try to go to kind of new ones if possible. Which ones do you miss? Well, I miss a restaurant like Le Mal des Oliviers. I, I yeah. miss, you know, which one I miss the most? I miss La Lou. Oh, I miss yeah. The most. And um, La Lou was another restaurant that was run by Luc Laporte on Pine Avenue, which has been ripped up now for what two years yeah. but i hear that pine avenue when they reopen it is going to be spectacular um and i actually know somebody who's interested in taking over la Luz. so if anybody has a lot of money to spare i know the perfect person to take over that restaurant but that restaurant was magic i mean it was the most beautiful the most romantic the most whatever um all the greatest sommeliers in montreal came out of that restaurant and then it closed because the building was sold and then there was a flood and nobody took it over. And the owner now lives in BC from what I hear and they don't see the building. And, you know, how many empty buildings are in Montreal now, you know? Hey. Yeah, and that's, well, I'm glad you mentioned 2K because I went once and I, I, I highly recommend, you know, if you can save some money for a special occasion, do it once. Like find, you know, Maison Bolud or 2K or, you know, like the, like swing for the fences and and experience that experience one time because yeah. it's a special special thing yeah and it's not I, I agree with you totally yeah yeah and i really i've got to, i gotta tell you we we don't miss the winter uh but uh oh my god we miss the restaurants and the food and and uh 
you know, it's one of those things that you don't think of, you know, it's the old song, right? You don't know what you got till it's gone. And, yeah. and it's, uh, it, it, it's fun to talk to you about these things because, um, I'm trying not to burst into tears. <laughs> <laughs> Collect so, yourself, I, man. I understand, you completely. I understand you completely. Like I said, at the beginning of the podcast, that's the reason I still live here. Yeah. You know, even when I go away to, you know, France is having terrible time now with food, France, because oh. a lot of things are coming in those vacuum bags. People, they Every nobody can find staff, right? So what's happening? A lot of there are too many restaurants for the number of staff that are around. So they're getting these vacuum packed meals that are just reheated and dumped yeah. on your plate with no love, you know. Oh, Leslie, I know it's anathema to Montrealers of our generation to speak well of Toronto, but it's become a world class city, no question. Yeah. How is their restaurant scene now? You know, I recently went to Toronto and I went to a very good restaurant called Pompette. Um, there's a, there are, there are a lot of great restaurants in Toronto. I think that this always, it's always, so there are a few things very hard to get a table. Okay. And in Montreal, it's getting harder too, by the way, I haven't been to express for a long time just cause I can't get a table and I never like calling in for favors. That's something people are like, Oh, call it. I'm like, I'm never going to do that unless, you know, something really bad happens. But uh, so Toronto, very hard to get a table, expensive. And I find in Toronto, I would rather eat somewhere that's not necessarily French, although that restaurant Pompette that I talked about is French and is very good. It's just that I think we do that kind of food here better. You know, the local ingredient French food, I think for the price, we do it better here. Um, there's great Italian in Toronto. There's um, great bakeries in Toronto. I really like Toronto now. And I grew up with the father who said, you know, I'd rather go to hell than move to Toronto. That kind of thing. <laughs> but I, I would move, you know, I would move to Toronto. They don't need restaurant critics or, you know, food writers. But I, I like Toronto. I think it's exciting. There's a lot of uh, great food outside of the continental food, Italian, French, you know, that we know of. And it's exciting. You know, there's a lot of opportunity in Toronto. The big problem in Toronto is that it's so expensive to open a restaurant is that you're not getting a lot of restaurant owners and chefs who open the restaurant, but restaurant groups who get in a chef. And, you know, if you look at the last Michelin stars that came out in Toronto, a lot of the people who are given Michelin stars do not own their restaurants. They're part of restaurant groups. And that's not always the best way to have a restaurant. I, I prefer the chef owned restaurant with the, the person doing the cooking who owns it. The personal touch. Yeah. I, hard. yeah. I had a, a meal at a, it's become a favorite restaurant of mine in, in Toronto at a small family run place called Taverniti where the grandmother was in the kitchen and, and they didn't say you had the table for an hour and the food was made, you know, grandma made the food. And, and, and I know what you're saying because now there's a lot of, and I'm, you know, especially out here, we experience a lot, um, part of the Dattara chain or part of the global food group or, you know, whatever, as opposed to, you know, like normal apres. You yeah. know, in the yeah. kitchen in, or in the window, as you say, yeah. Yeah. You know, trying, great, trying, to make, there, trying to make a go of it. Yeah, there's a great restaurant here I didn't mention called Antoinetta, which is on Saint-Zotique near Papineau. Mm -hmm. And it's three guys who oh, decide to open up a restaurant together and they're serving you and they're in the kitchen and yeah. they're writing the menu and it's them. And there's another one called Paloma, which is a yeah. father and daughter. And they're doing everything. The daughter's a sommelier, yeah. the father does it. He brings it to the table. She serves you the wine. Yeah. You know, that's a great feeling. It's like Barb at the Monkland Tavern, another favorite of mine. You know, Barb's at the door, Barb's at the bar. Barb will come and serve you. You know, she's yeah. she's running the, you know, uh, Barb and Josh own that restaurant and they're 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 hands on is what yeah. it is. And that is part of what makes it so good, I think. Yeah. They're proud and they're legends in the yeah. city. They're important people. You know, yeah. Mr. Masson at L'Express was a legend. Why? Because he loved his job. You could sense it and you wanted to go say hi to him. And if he said hi back to you, it was as good as Johnny Carson asking you to sit down <laughs> after a set. You wow. know? So what what do you think that is today, Leslie, that you you call for, you know, you call Express and they tell you, uh, yes, we have a table at 430 or 1030 tonight. Like there's uh, like what's going on? Like, I assume what, it's all driven by money. No. Well, no. But what's happening? There are two things happening. One is that because of the lack of staffing, L'Express that used to be open till 3 a.m. is now closing, I believe, at 11 or midnight. So they're losing a lot of hours there. They don't do breakfast anymore, which is what they used to. They just don't have enough hands in the oh. kitchen. 
So it's reduced hours, and I believe they've reduced the day. I don't think they're open seven days. I think they're open six now. So this is the same at Le Mayac, Express, all of these places that are busy. You're going to see it's a lot harder to get a table. The second thing that's happened is 6 o'clock is the new 8 o'clock, okay? So everybody wants to eat early. Why? Because during the pandemic, we all got used to all this damn cocooning. So we all want to run home and watch The Crown, okay? So everybody... <laughs> is eating early but you know and i hate this because i've always said the biggest the best kept secret in the restaurant world eat early why not because you want to run home and watch netflix but if you do you do but um because in the beginning of the night everybody's calm nobody's yet drunk <laughs> in the kitchen uh i'm kidding but um so things are calm all the mise en place has been done by the chefs so let's say you go in there at six o'clock and you order duck they're going to give you the nicest piece of duck if you're in there at 10, you're getting the piece of duck that nobody <laughs> wanted to use at 6 o'clock, okay? Right. So all the best stuff, the, the plates, they're calm, they're nicer, no rush, right? Mm -hmm. By the end of the service, they all want to kill each other. They want to get out of there. The yeah. duck is over, so they're using last you know, week's duck. So it's it's really the best time to eat in a restaurant, and you can usually stay a little longer. But now everybody wants to eat earlier, so it's gonna, that's why the 10 o'clock tables are open. Why can't they, is it because working at a restaurant sucks? Like why, why, why can't they find people anymore? Because a lot of people during the pandemic realized that they were never seeing their kids, that they were working late hours, that anytime that everybody else was on vacation, they weren't. So they decided that, you know, maybe they'd get paid and pay and the pay in the restaurant business sucks. And it always has. And the waiters are getting paid more than the people in the kitchen. And if you're getting paid, when I was a cooking teacher, a lot of the kids gave up a lot of the really great kids gave up cooking to go into construction. You know, one of my greatest students I ever saw, I was one day taking an airplane. He was at security at Dorval. I'm like, no, he's wow. like, he's like, yes. He said, I cook for my family now and I work here and I get paid a lot more. The pay is lousy. So the thing is that people, if they, if they want to keep their staff, they got to pay them more, right? They've got to give them better working conditions, maybe dental insurance, right? Which nobody had in the restaurant business before. And, you know, so what's going to happen is that we're all going to pay more to go to restaurants. And I don't know if you've noticed, but restaurants are a lot more expensive these days. Boy, are they ever. I, you know, my, 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 my wife, uh, my wife and I both, Jess and I both love a steakhouse called Highs. Mm, famous, and, yeah. Yeah, I love Highs. And, and we, you know, go to Highs just for the cheese toast, for God's sake. But a, um, a 10 ounce filet at Highs is now $91. And, and that, you know, you, and, and Jess always says to me, you know, we can make much better steak at the home. Right. Um, and, and I get it because if you want to buy the right piece of filet to serve, that's that's the markup now. Yeah, and, that, and eat you know, beef is uh, off the charts. Yeah, off the chicken, charts. Yeah. Chicken is like, I'm paying $35 for a chicken that was $27 just a month ago. Butter. Yeah. I mean, these things are just skyrocketing in price. And that's why I'm, that's why another reason I'm encouraging people to cook at home a bit. I'm not saying don't go to restaurants. I'm just saying, learn to cook so you can also eat well at home and don't buy fast food and don't go to those chain restaurants with really second rate food for very high prices you know? yeah. or paying for wine that you can buy yourself uh, and uncork at home. I mean, I know it's fun to eat out, but you know, there is, you don't have to eat out every night or just, I always say, keep it for special occasions. Like we said before. You've been very generous with your time. Uh, just while we're talking wine, uh, before I let you go, how does Le Express do it? A, it's an amazing list, and B, the corkage is very small. Like it's so reasonable, it's crazy. It is. It is. Although it's not as reasonable. Let's say you're. I think where you are in BC, you're actually they have a real corkage fee that you can bring a bottle of wine and say, if I give you twenty five dollars, can I bring my own wine? Which we can't do here. Right. But what L'Express does is they they buy at the right time. They have a very deep cellar with a lot of choices, and they've made that decision not to. Uh, jab the customer gouging people yes. with wine prices and yeah. maybe they're smart enough to realize that if people aren't paying too much for a bottle of wine hey they might get two bottles of wine right that's right um the book is called make every dish delicious delicious make <laughs> every dish delicious oh for christ's sake that's my next book yeah yeah if you're walk, watching on youtube i'm holding it up Make Every Dish Delicious, uh, Modern Classics and Essential Tips for Total Kitchen Confidence. The book is amazing. You. If if you've never if you've never bought a cookbook, buy this one. Um, I, I wish Jess was here to gush about your book. She absolutely loves it, uses it all the time. The, the French cookbook is all full of stains, which is a high compliment. <laughs> 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 
that's, that's a good sign. Yeah. And, Tara, and what's the what's the other book, uh, uh, Leslie? Yeah, she, 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 this is a new one called Un Weekend Chez Leslie. It's about weekend cooking where you have, you know, you have a bit more time, a little bit right. more elaborate dinner party hints. Like if you have a dinner party, um, clean out your medicine cabinet because right. people look and so take the antidepressants and the Viagra out of there before the dinner party. <laughs> Just saying, just saying. People are like people don't snoop. I'm like people snoop. Oh, yeah, they snoop. Take the fungal hey, creams out of the medicine cabinet. You know? be, be, <laughs> before we we let you go, we want you to be witness to something called the tweet sheet. Ted, please explain the tweet sheet to Leslie. The tweet sheet, Leslie, is something I do on my morning show uh, Monday to Friday on Light 106.7. I pick three of the funnier tweets uh, that I've stumbled across. And sometimes I'll find, if you're on Twitter, you know, sometimes you'll find something funny that you can't use on the radio. So we save those ones for the podcast. So this can be a little salty. Uh, I don't know if all three of these are salty, but we saved three for the, uh, for the podcast. Let's see what we've got here this, uh, for this episode. <clears throat> From at Trumpet Cake. I've been described as a nude Mr. Peanut without the hat and monocle and spats and shoes and cane and gloves, like completely nude, also with no genitals, just like a huge fucking peanut. This came from a physician. Oh, my God. <laughs> that guy, Ted Travelstead, writes for uh, Fox Television. He's very funny. He's a TV writer. What, what's his Twitter handle, Ted? At Trumpet Cake. <laughs> He's a good he's a good follow. He's very funny. He's irreverent to say the least, as you can see from that. All right. What do we got next, Poseidon? From at Shen the Bird. Me. Remember, God gives his hardest battles to his strongest soldiers. God looking down at me. Oh, I fucking hate that guy. Give him a hard battle. <laughs> <laughs> And okay. from uh, from at Shat in my hat, <laughs> I drank from the garden hose when I was a kid, and my life turned out fine. Looks around, bursts into tears. <laughs> I love that. Who didn't drink out of the garden hose? <laughs> That's right. Yeah, yeah. Leslie, um, I th thanks so much for doing this. I I miss our chats and uh, our I've, dinners. I, and I was just going to say, I've been fortunate enough to be the recipient of a dinner invitation to your house, which is the most spectacular thing, almost if some, t I would say even better than a, an evening at Le Mas des Olivier. Because, because we don't have to leave quickly, right? Because yeah, we, you know. Yeah, you don't chase us out of the house and a dinner invite at Leslie's house comes with a sommelier, a wine critic at the right. other end of the table. Right, right. My boyfriend, Jean Aubry, is, a, is the wine writer for Le Devoir, and so we always have a lot of wine here. Oh, it he is. talks about it, and we have, uh, that's a good coupling there, because um, it works oh. out well. It was one of the... No loud, like, you know, restaurants, too. There are two things we didn't mention. Two loud music and yes. two slow lights. You can't yes. see people you're eating with, you know? <laughs> yeah, it's, I. you know what? I, it's a dead giveaway. I hate to do it, but I did it the other night, and it embarrasses my wife to no end holding the phone and putting the light on the menu. Oh, yeah. She said, you look like you're a hundred for Christ's sake. Right. I do that too. <laughs> I do. Or you and take uh, a picture of the menu and you have to look yeah. at it because the writing's too small. Yeah. Yours actually, uh, uh, Jess and I talk about this all the time. Um, yours was the, I think the invitation to your house was the last great meal we had in Montreal oh, right. before we left. Well, we have yeah. to do it again. So next yeah. time you're here, standing invitation. Okay. Um, thank you, Leslie, for everything, and uh, thanks for agreeing to do this and sitting with us knuckleheads and talking about food and cooking. And, again, congratulations on the books. Just amazing. Thank you. I miss you guys, so take care. Bye, okay. Ted. Bye, Bye Leslie. And, uh, okay. I'm going to go Bye. shuffle the snow. Okay. okay. <laughs> thank you, Leslie. Bye, Don't guys. forget to hang up. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. See you later. Well, Ted. That was a good one. There's another one in, uh, and uh, boy, that was a good one, man. Did I love having her on these? Like I said, uh, these uh, these books um, are incredible. I've really enjoyed watching. Uh, Jess is just is becoming more and more accomplished in the kitchen, and she absolutely loves these books. And uh, Leslie's a hoot, although um, I, d I don't think she enjoyed the tweet sheet. <laughs> well, I wasn't too sure. I mean, you know, it's it's not for everybody. 
Uh -huh. And that's that's no it, no, it isn't. That's the nature of comedy. One man's floor yeah. is another man's ceiling. Poseidon, you were going to say? I have to say, I think this was my favorite guest of all time you guys have ever had. Oh, really? Eh? This yeah, because great, I'm fat. Dude. Because you're fat. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Poseidon, you are not fat, by the way. Uh, I, I, um, I, as as any Montrealer knows. Uh, talking about food is a pastime. Everybody yeah. talks about food. A passion, right? even. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, a, it's a passion. And and I'll tell you from experience, because um, I've lived in other places. Um, uh, when I was in, in my 20s, I lived in Winnipeg, so that was sort of inconsequential because I had no money anyway, so it didn't matter. And uh, when I lived in Calgary, um, it, was, it was okay, but I really, really missed... Uh, uh, Montreal restaurants. And uh, now that we're out in British Columbia, my wife and I pine for uh, food in Montreal all the time. So did, are you guys gone? No, oh, we're no. still, no, we're no. still here. <laughs> yeah. We're, uh, we are uh, hanging on your every word. Leslie said she, <laughs> Leslie said she was going uh, to uh, shovel the snow, uh, which I will use as a segue into uh, if you want a vehicle, mm. it'll get you through the snow. You should yes. go up to Jaguar Land Rover Laval and see the line of 2023 Land Rovers. Uh, your choice. Would you like the Range Rover? Would you like the Range Rover Sport? How about the Range Rover Velar? Or perhaps the Discovery Sport? Those bad boys will cut through snow like a hot knife through butter. Uh, and I haven't even gotten to the Defender. I think that's my favorite Land Rover at all. That thing is like a luxury tank. Beautiful vehicles. Uh, practical vehicles, particularly if you live up north, and that's their target demographic at Jaguar Land Rover Laval. Uh, they, uh, I mean, you know, it doesn't matter where you live, but they they tend to cater to the Laurentians crowd, and um, that's uh, that's the kind of vehicle you want if you're going to be uh, driving up north, particularly at this time of the year. And Jaguar, of course, has their SUV now. They have the F Pace, and they also have uh, a yummy mummy version called the E Pace which is a nice vehicle as well. And, you know, we've said this many times, that the, you can get many different brands of luxury vehicles uh, at many different dealerships. Uh, it's, it's the shopping experience and the customer service that makes a difference, and that's where Jaguar, Land Rover, Laval get it right. They're salt-of-the-earth, down-to-earth down people. Uh, Nino and Renato Di Cubellis, who are the owners and operators of Jaguar, Land Rover, Laval, are just the best Joes you could possibly meet. And, and uh, boy, did they make me laugh when, he, when we had dinner with them last summer, Ter. I didn't, I never knew this. Uh, they informed me that Fiat sound, stands for Fix It Again, Tony. <laughs> 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 I had never heard that before. No, no, and it man. wasn't, and that's not a shot at Fiat. That, no. was just a, that was just an anecdote they regaled us with over dinner. But they're such nice guys. And, uh, and their personalities and attitude uh, trickles down throughout the dealership. JaguarLaval.com and LandRoverLaval.com. If you're looking for a luxury vehicle, don't buy anything else until you go see them. I know we sound like a broken record. If you are a regular with the podcast uh, or you've listened to us over the years, you know we're always going on about family businesses. But I, I don't know about you, uh, but uh, my, much like the folks at... Uh, at uh, Jaguar Land Rover Laval, uh, the folks at Merson are another family-run business that we've been speaking. We've been speaking on their behalf for a very, very long time. And I don't know about you, but now everything is run by corporations and a wash and greed, and it's you know tough to uh, make sure you can see the manager or the owner. It's it's. I I just love having that experience with family-run businesses because you know they care about what they're doing. You know that the owners are in the shop, so the shop is is properly run. If you ever have an issue, the owner is at the counter or upstairs in his office, um, and that's the way the Mersons run their shop. If you uh, are a, a driver of a vehicle, and it doesn't matter what kind of vehicle you drive, the Mersons can look after it. And I know today, the you know all the all the vehicles have got computer driven this, that, and the other thing. Um, the Mersons can handle it. They well, they can, can also handle electric as well. A lot of people, yeah. increasingly people are driving electric vehicles, and Mersons technicians are equipped and trained to handle your electric vehicle as well. Yeah, they stay up to date. And uh, Cara and Celso are the new generation of Mersons. 
uh, now that Mark and, and Bonnie are retired. And uh, it's a family-run business that's been looking after Montreal families for uh, at least the last thousand years. I think ever since the wheel was invented. It actually, Augmerson invented the wheel in the Cote St. Luke tar pits in 10,000 BC. <laughs> and it, now that it's uh, winter, uh, you want to get winter tires, that's the stop, right, Ted? Yokohama or Nokian, those are uh, the brands that they uh, specialize in. And uh, the Mersons have tires for uh, all cars and uh, all budgets. They'll uh, They'll fix you up. Uh, regardless of what you need. And and it's like Terry says, it's that personal touch that Leslie was talking about with restaurants. Yes. Restaurants that are owned by big groups now no longer have that personal touch. Merson have affiliation with corporations like Yokohama and Nokian, but at the end of the day, they run their own shop, and uh, and that's reflected in the customer service. And it's uh, Juste au coin de Saint-Jacques et Cavendish. Wait. Oui. Not, not exactly at the corner, but... Uh, just around the corner from St. Jacques and Cavendish, right across the street from the uh, what used to be called the Loblaws. What do they call that now? I'm not it's sure. Not, Is it not still the Loblaws? No, no, they don't call it Loblaws anymore in Quebec. It's uh, now uh, uh, Chez uh, Esti. Uh, she, <laughs> she, uh, anyway, <laughs> it's uh, just past the corner of St. Jacques and Cavendish or MersonAuto.com. And we are very, very grateful to uh, our supporters because that's the way... We can keep doing the podcast, and the podcast title sponsor is our friends at the UPS Store Canada. Thanks to David Drucker and the over 360 locations of the UPS Store Canada. If you're enjoying the podcast, by the way, uh, visit our Facebook page, will you? It's just the Standing By Facebook page, right, Ted? Yes, sir. And we've also got a Twitter account and uh, Instagram as well. And uh, as Terry said, we appreciate uh, we appreciate you listening. And boy, would we ever be grateful if you would uh, spread the word and share the podcast as well. Yes, yes. Thank you very much. Our uh, thanks to Poseidon, who uh, said uh, it was what our best guest ever. Yes. Is that what you said? In, in my opinion, in my opinion, because we talked about food, and he's a fat exactly, fatty. Exactly. He thinks. <laughs> Yeah, but Chris, aren't you hungry now? I'm very hungry. You know, Poseidon and I could go to L'Express now, Terry, and you can't. Yeah, piss off the both of you. <laughs> <laughs> I can go to, uh, let's see, I can go to Cactus Club. Enjoy. <laughs> what's, a, what's a Cactus Club? Cactus Club is a chain, big chain out here that a lot of people love. And you know what they line up for here? And I can't, je comprends pas, <laughs> they line up for the Olive Garden. Yeah, God I damn it, it, I hate BC. Yeah. Yeah, I believe it. I believe it. <laughs> Listen, it's one of the most beautiful places you'll ever lay your eyes on, but uh, I'm not going. I don't give a shit about breadsticks. No. I ain't lying. I've never been to the Olive Garden. I shouldn't talk. You're not missing but anything. Thank you very much. I didn't think I was, but they line up for it out here. So what are you going to do? Uh, Ted, thank you. I'll see you next time, sir. Yeah, uh, next time. Don't forget to join Ted on his. Uh, a highly rated, much talked about morning show, weekday mornings, 5.30 to 9. Light 106.7, 106.7 FM, online at light1067.ca, on the iHeartRadio app, and your smart speaker. À la prochaine. Standing by, the Terry and Ted podcast has been brought to you by the UPS Store Canada. The UPS Store near you is locally owned and operated by a member of your small business community. 